Okay, so this section is predicate logic at 9.1 from the Power of Logic, and it talks about symbolization, but being a little bit more in depth. So in the past, the way we would symbolize Bill is tall is just with a simple atomic statement letter, right? Something like B, T, A, whichever atomic statement letter you wanted to use. You could symbolize one whole statement with just using one letter. So what we're going to do now is we break a statement into two parts and make everything a little bit more specific. So every statement has two parts. There's a name, or what we call in logic an individual constant, and then there's a predicate. So what an individual constant is, is something that you refer to somebody uniquely. So the most common example of that would be somebody's name, Bill, Ted, James, Dan, whoever. <clears throat> but it's specifically, the definition of an individual constant is a label that identifies a unique individual, right? So technically the, the 47 could be an individual constant if that's what you wanted to call your cat or your son or daughter, right? If I named my son 47, then 47 would be an individual constant, right? So Mostly, the most common thing you're going to see individual constants, though, are just names. So, the way we symbolize individual constants are with lowercase letters. So, Bill is an individual constant, right? It's a name. So, we're going to symbolize that with maybe a little b. So, you can note that however you want. A little b right there. However you want to think about it. Now, that's what an individual constant is. And we use individual constants lowercase letters, right? But for capital letters, we use something else. Predicates. So what is a predicate? A predicate is something that defines or uh, explains something about an individual constant. It's something that you can be. You can be tall, you can be small, you can be a runner, you can be a bike rider, you can be a dog, you can be a cat, all these different things that you can be. So that's what a predicate is. That's the kind of easiest way of thinking about it. It's something that you can be. So we symbolize that with a capital letter. So in this case, we'll choose maybe capital T. So the way we would write this in logic is the predicate comes first, right? capital T, lowercase b. That's all there is to it. So Bill is tall is symbolized with capital T, lowercase b. You try uh, James is an Aggie. Right? How do we do this? What's the first thing we do? We identify our parts. James is our individual constant. Is an Aggie. Right? All this is just note-taking devices. You can do whatever you want. You can use puffy clouds, underlines, stars, whatever. So how do we do this, right? Well, our predicate is going to be a capital letter. So I'll choose A for being an Aggie. And then I'll choose lowercase j for James, right? That's all there is to it. Now, that's our first two parts, our individual constants with lowercase letters and our predicates with capital letters. But what happens when you don't know who you're talking about, when you don't know exactly what individual you're speaking about? So, for example, what would I, how do I say everyone is happy? Everyone is happy. That might be something you would say, but I don't necessarily know how to symbolize it, right? I recognize that is happy is a predicate, but how do I say everyone is happy? This is, means I'm going to have to introduce two new concepts. And that is quantifiers. We have the universal. Sorry, I really can't spell. I think that's right. Universal. And we have our existential. Oh, Lord. Existential? Man, I really got to learn how to spell. Either way, these are our two quantifiers. One of the quantifiers represents all, universal, and the existential represents some. So the way we use these are in place of unknown names. So 
everyone is happy. The only way I would be able to spell out everyone is happy is by saying James is happy and Bill is happy and Ted is happy and Mark is happy and Professor Menzel is happy and go all the way through these uh, every single name in the universe. That would take a really long time. So we don't want to do that. So instead we say H X. Now we have to also talk about another piece, right? We have our quantifiers, right? Universal, existential quantifiers, but we also have variables. Lowercase x, y, z. So in math class, variables stood for unknown numbers. In this class, they stand for unknown names. So x here is holding the space of an unknown name. And the way we know, right, every variable either stands for some name or it stands for every name, right? Either there's a universal variable or an existential variable. And the way we determine that is based off of which quantifier we're using. So I want to say that everyone is happy. So should I use the universal quantifier or the existential quantifier, right? Obviously, I'm going to use the universal quantifier. So that's the translation for everyone is happy. That says, right, really an easy way to think about it is X is happy. X is happy, right? Just like James is an Aggie or Bill is tall. X is happy. So what does X stand for? Let me check what quantifier is that? A universal quantifier. So everyone is happy. How would you quantify or how would you say someone is sad? Right? What would you do? Right? It's just the exact same process. Someone is sad. So we would say, how about S? We can use any variable we want. Right? So let's just use Y. We used X last time. Why not Y? So SY. So which quantifier do we use? Y is sad. I want to say someone is sad. So I use the existential quantifier. Right? So I used X is with the universal quantifier, Y is with the universal, the, the existential quantifier. I could have used Y's here and Z's here or Z's here and Y's here. It doesn't matter which which variable you use. Right? Doesn't matter. Okay, so now that we've got that established, let's talk about some more complex sentences, right? You guys remember from the first test, A E I O, right? Universal <laughs> affirmative, particular negative, all the business. Well, that's back again. These are our most basic. Uh, these are our most basic quantified statements right here. But to step them up a notch, we're going to quantify and practice A, E, I, and O. So all mammals, or sorry, all dogs are mammals. How do we go about that? Well, the first thing we do is we identify our predicates, dogs and mammals. Remember, these are nouns, but they are not names. These are nouns, but they are not names. There's nobody named dog or mammals. Right? These are individual categories of things. So I also recognize that I need to use right my universal quantifier. So I want to say all dogs are mammals, right? So I know that I'm going to use dx, just making notes. Again with symbolization, it's better to write something down. I know that I'm going to use a universal quantifier. Right? Put some parentheses around it. So the real question is just how do I put a symbol there that communicates all dogs are mammals? A lot of people want to put a dot. Right? Putting a dot there seems like it would be a good idea, but what does that actually say? X is a dog and X is a mammal. Well, what does X stand for? Everything. So what this actually says is everybody is a dog or everything is a dog and everything is a mammal. That's not what we want to say. The correct answer here is the arrow. Right? So read out loud, if X is a dog, then X is a mammal. So everything that is a dog is therefore a mammal. Right? Pretty straightforward. A tip, universal quantifier equals arrow. No frogs or cats. So the same process for an E statement, a universal negative. Right? No frogs. I'm going to use Y this time. Why not? No frogs are cats. Switching up my variables. Well, I know that I'm going to use a universal quantifier because we're talking about a universal negative statement. 
no frogs are cats. So, again, knowing that I often use an arrow with a universal, I'll try that first. It's better to write something down than ask yourself, if it, is that right? So a lot of people want to put the tilde, right, recognizing no means a tilde. They want to put the tilde here, right? But that's actually not correct. The tilde goes here, and I'll show you why. Right? Everything that is a frog is therefore for not a cat, right? If we put the tilde over here, it's um, all not frogs are cats, and that's actually not what we want to say, right? We don't want to say that. So this is the appropriate way to do this, right? No frogs, or sorry, if you're a frog, then you're not a cat. Moving on to the particular side of things, we see some cats are dogs. So again, same process. C, I'll use Z this time. And D, Z. Well, now the question is what kind of quantifier do I use to quantify this? Right? I'm going to use sum, so I need my existential quantifier because I'm talking about sum. So then I have to ask myself, okay, well, what symbol do I use? Right? Some people say wedge, some people say dot, right? The correct answer is the dot. Right? There's something out there that is a cat and something out there that is a dog at the same time. Something is both of these things at once. That's how we quantify a particular affirmative statement. Interesting enough though, we can do a particular or we can do a universal negative very similar to this by saying there's something out there that is a frog and a cat. There's something out there that's both of those. Right? And then putting a tilde out front, saying there is nothing out there that is both of those. So either one of these would be a correct answer for negative, for an E statement. That's the correct answer for the I statement. So we have one more example. Some cats are not dogs. Sorry, some cats are not dogs. So again, same process. Identify your predicates. So we have CX dx, right, and then again, what kind of quantifier? Existential quantifier, because we're talking about sum. So, right, just like I know to use an arrow with universal, a tip is use dots with existential. So now the last bit is, right, and this says some cats are dogs. We don't want to say that, right? There's something out there that is a cat and something out there that is a dog, but how can I incorporate the not? That's pretty self-explanatory, right? Putting a tilde in front of the D. Something is a cat and something is not a dog at the same time. So that's the most basic I statement. So if you understand those four concepts, I know that's a little fast, but go through them again, work out some different examples. If you can understand those, then you understand the basics of quantification, right? And then it's going to get a little bit more complicated and more elaborate as we start introducing two-place uh, predicates and then also two-place quantifieds and uh, that'll take place, I think, in 9.5 and get a little bit more elaborate. But particular logic symbolization is one of those things where it really seems complicated, but if you put pen to paper and just write something down and analyze it, you're going to be in a lot better shape. So this takes a lot of practice problems. So please uh, make sure you go over this a couple of times and definitely hit up the web tutor.